Hi ladies, so today we are going to look a little bit closer at two stories of Jesus healing an anonymous woman and then also Jairus' daughter. This is from Luke 8, 40 through 56. So let's jump right in. The Bible says this, Now when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue, and falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. As Jesus went, the people pressed around him, and there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, Who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter, Peter said, Master, the crowd surrounding you are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, um, and declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house, Jairus's house, came and said, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher any more. But Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, Do not fear. Only believe, and she will be well. And when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him, except Peter and John and James, and the father of the mother and the child, and the father and mother of the child. And all were weeping and mourning for her. But he said, Do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, knowing she was dead. But taking her by the hand, he called, saying, Child, arise. I love the way Mark puts it in the NIV translation. Jesus took her by the hand and said, little girl, get up. And her spirit returned and she got up at once and he directed that something should be given her to eat. And her parents were amazed, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. So let's look first at Jairus. It says that he was a ruler of the synagogue. The ruler of the synagogue was the elder in charge of the public services and the care of the facilities. He was the elder in charge. He saw to it that people were appointed to pray, read the scriptures, give the sermon. He presided over the orders of the synagogue and was usually a man of reputation and wealth. So Jairus' colleagues, the other Jewish religious leaders, and some of the other synagogue leaders who were opposed to Jesus, which most of them were, would certainly not approve of Jairus asking for Jesus' help, and especially not publicly asking for his help. The things that Jesus had done and taught in the synagogues had aroused the anger of the scribes and Pharisees, some of whom were probably Jairus' friends. But Jairus let all that go. He laid all that down. His wealth, his reputation, his friends, his social status, possibly his job, his pride, his doubt, all of it. He let it all go in order to come to Jesus. Why? Because he was desperate. His child was dying. The desperation to save his little daughter rose up in him and caused him to fall down to his knees before the Lord Jesus and beg him for what only he could do. Jairus had heard of the miracles Jesus had performed for others, but it wasn't that that would bring him to faith in Jesus as Lord. Jairus knew the scriptures, and he had seen how Jesus' coming fulfilled the prophecies, but it wasn't that that would bring him to faith in Jesus as Lord. He must have heard or caught wind of Jesus' powerful preaching and the authority with which Jesus spoke and revealed great truths of God, but even that wouldn't bring Jairus to Jesus. It's like that with our loved ones who don't know him, isn't it? We see all these wonderful things about the Lord and we try to explain it and share our thoughts and pour out our hearts about Jesus to our loved ones and they still won't come to him. And neither would Jairus. 
He hardened his heart just enough to all that he'd heard and seen about Jesus so that he wouldn't have to lay down his life, his life of reputation and wealth and pride and religion, so he wouldn't have to lay down his life and follow Jesus. An interesting thing about Jairus is that he was waiting for Jesus. Right before this scene with Jesus and Jairus, Jesus had just come back from across the huge lake of Galilee where he was in the country of the Gerasenes healing another man who was overtaken by demons. And the scripture says that when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him because they were all waiting for him. And Jairus was in that crowd. So this was a premeditated act of Jairus. His faith brought him to Jesus. It wasn't just a fleeting moment of passionate desperation for Jairus. In fact, we read later in verse 49 that his household knew he was going to see Jesus because someone from his household came to where he was and told him that his daughter died and not to trouble Jesus anymore. So it's not like Jairus was walking along the road, saw some people gathered, found out Jesus was coming, and decided to give it a last-ditch effort. No, he decided at home with his family that this was the right thing to do. He counted the cost and decided to lay it all down and come to Jesus. Come, Jesus, Jairus says in Matthew's account when he steps out from the crowd, just come to my house and only lay your hand upon my daughter and she will live. And I just want to pause here and highlight the fact that Jesus here himself is faced with a choice to send this Jewish leader away, one of the ones who had likely spoken against him, one of the ones from the crowd and type of people that wanted to exterminate him, one of the ones who was from the brood of vipers and self-righteous hypocrites who were leading many astray. Jesus could have sent him away unhealed and told him to go and reap what he's sown. But I want you to see here what Jesus did in agreeing to give his love and his healing power to Jairus. I want you to see how Jesus turned the other cheek. In Matthew 5, 38 and 39, Jesus says, You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. First, let's look at what a slap on the right cheek means. What is Jesus talking about here? For someone to slap a person on their right cheek using their right hand, which is the dominant hand for almost everyone, it would have to be a backhanded slap, which is meant to illustrate not physical abuse, but rather an act of insult or scorn or disgrace to shame someone's honor. Jesus is telling us that when we experience insult and scorn from another person, when our dignity is insulted to not retaliate with vengeance, and he's not only telling us not to retaliate, but he's telling us to turn to them the other cheek also, to open ourselves up to them again, to be present with them again in sincerity, almost as if that slap on the first cheek didn't even happen. How can we do that? Because I'm sorry, if you slap me on my cheek, I want to slap back. <laughs> so how can we do that? There's one powerful way I know of, and that is seeking and finding and continuing to pursue understanding on who I am in Christ. Why? Because if I know who I am in Christ, man's scorn cannot have the victory over me. And even more than that, if I know who I am in Christ, even in the midst of being insulted, my compassion for the one insulting me can be stirred because I know that I have something precious and powerful that I can give to this person that they don't have. And that is the wonderful, sustaining, powerful love of Christ. Who does he say that I am? He is the only one who can define my worth, and my dignity because he's the one who made me. And if I believe I am who he says I am, and our identities are in every chapter of the New Testament and all over the Old Testament, if I believe I am who he says I am, then no one's insult can touch me, 
and their insults will have no power over me truly. And I will find the strength and the courage and yes, even the love to open myself back up to the person who has insulted me. And what a powerful testimony to the power and love of God that is when we don't retaliate and when we don't run and hide, but when we stand with strength before our offender and continue to show them sincerely the love of God. People get saved that way. But it takes time and effort to gain that understanding of who we are in Christ. The Bible says God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, and it takes diligence to grow in our understanding of our true identities as daughters of the Most High King. But it's worth it. It's powerful, and it's worth it. So Jesus agrees to go with Jairus to heal his daughter. While they were on their way to Jairus's house, though, we see that something else happens. The people were all pressing around him. I mean, they'd been waiting for him to return, and now he was slipping away again. So they were all pressing around him, and Jesus feels his healing power going out of him. He perceives that someone touched him in faith and was healed. The Bible describes this someone as an anonymous woman who had a blood discharge for 12 years, who, in the Gospel of Mark, it says, suffered much under many physicians who had spent all she had trying to get better, but who only got worse. It says she had heard the reports about Jesus, so she braved the crowd in order to come and see him. Let's pause for a minute and unpack this woman's condition. This woman's condition of a blood discharge left her ceremonially unclean. That means she was distanced from her normal social and religious activities. She was isolated and she was shamed. Because based on Jewish law, she was not permitted to be in public without making people around her aware that she is unclean. Imagine that. Imagine the shame she had to carry with her everywhere she went, the shame of being unclean. She either bore the shame of telling people around her, acquaintances and strangers alike, of this very personal, unclean condition, or she bore the shame in secret if she decided to break the law and not tell those around her about her condition, which would make her unclean and a lawbreaker, even more shameful. She bore the shame of her state if she went out and she bore the shame of her state if she stayed in because she knew why she was staying in. And isn't this how we see the woman approach the Lord? Hiding, mixing in with the crowd, attempting to be unseen by the people around her and by the Lord Jesus, taking just enough of what she needs from Jesus and then shutting down any further intimacy or exposure or relationship. She said to herself, if I only touch his garment, I will be made well. And she did touch his garment, and she was made well, and that would have been enough for her. But that was not enough for the Lord. He immediately turned around in the crowd, and he said, Who touched my garments? Then it says, When the woman saw she was not hidden, she came forward. Nothing is hidden from our Lord. He sees every one of us, and he sees everything about us. It says she came forward with fear and trembling and told him everything. One commentator says that her fear may have been partly because as she worked her way through the crowd to touch Jesus, she would have touched many other people, rendering them ceremonially unclean. And now the crowd would have turned on her in condemnation and humiliation. So we see again the woman's shame keeping her from stepping out and moving forward. But when she realized that she was not hidden from the Lord, what else could she really do? She came forward and she fell down at Jesus' feet and told him everything. And what did Jesus do? Did he mock her? Did he condemn her for touching him in all her uncleanness? Did he find fault with her for taking from him without asking? Did he rebuke her for hiding? No. He didn't do any of that. So what did he do? He called her daughter and gave her eternal life. This woman, unclean, shame-filled, desperate, fearful, daughter 
your faith has made you well. In the Greek, it says your faith has saved you. His final words to her, go in peace, suggests her spiritual salvation. He chose to heal her physically and spiritually. That's what our Jesus does, the great physician of all, who can heal what no doctor could ever heal. The Lord did something else when he called the woman forth out of the crowd. Because Jesus is the master multitasker, always working all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. By having her tell her story publicly in front of all those standing by, the woman would have testified and brought glory to the Lord. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy, Psalm 107 says. There is no doubt that some of those people in that crowd heard her words and then put their trust in the Savior. And maybe it was someone else's testimony that gave her courage to put her faith in him as healer too. So what did Jesus say to her? He said, your faith has made you well. How? How did her faith make her well? Does faith heal us? No. Faith brings us to the healer who is Jesus. But let's consider the woman's faith for a moment. This woman's faith, I mean, it was borderline superstitious. She kept saying to herself, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. If I just touch his clothes. She had an almost superstitious faith that caused her to run up on Jesus from behind, tag him, and then run back into the crowd. I mean, it comes across almost as like a last resort, almost like her faith in Jesus was like a last ditch superstitious effort. But look how the Lord honored her faith anyway. See, because it's not our faith that has the power. It's who we put our faith in. He's the one who's got the power. Faith is putting your hands out to receive that power. That's what faith is. The woman had faith in Jesus. We know that because Jesus said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. But I think we can look at her as an example of someone who maybe didn't have great faith, yet was still seen and loved and healed by Jesus. We have to remember not to put our faith in our faith. Sometimes we think if we just had more faith, then such and such would have happened, or so and so would be healed. We point to the passage in James James 5 that says, And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. The prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. The prayer of faith. Well, what is the prayer of faith? Maybe we can understand what it is better by considering what the prayer of faith is not. For instance, the prayer of faith is not a prayer of doubt and unbelief, or a prayer prayed out of duty, or a prayer prayed to put on a show. When talking about prayer, Jesus said, do not go on babbling like the pagans who think they'll be heard by God because of their many words. Babbling, meaningless, no heart engagement, no mind engagement, likely no holiness, holiness, no obedience, no love for God, no desire to see his will done on earth as it is in heaven. That's not a prayer of faith. So there's ways we can pray, which God will not hear. But the verse in James says, the prayer that is of faith will save the one who is sick. Why? Because the Lord will raise him up. The Lord hears our faith-filled prayers. So how do you know if you're praying in faith or if you're praying with enough faith? How much faith do you need in order for God to hear you and answer your prayer as it aligns with his will? This much. This is all you need. How do I know? Because in Matthew 17, Jesus says, If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can move mountains. That one little seed of faith is packed with so much power. Why? Because that little seed of faith will bring us to God who is all-powerful. And he'll either move that mountain for us by the power of his swift deliverance, or he'll bring us on the journey of showing us how to move the mountain through patient endurance, trust, 
surrender, and strong hope in every single one of his promises. So back to the text. While Jesus was still speaking to the woman, one of Jairus' friends came up to him and said, Your daughter has died. Just leave the teacher, Jesus, alone and go on home. At this point, Jairus had a choice to make. He either had to put his trust in his friend or put his trust in the Lord Jesus. No doubt, when he heard the words, your daughter is dead, his whole being convulsed with sorrow. Jesus' answer to Jairus in that moment was, do not fear, only believe. The literal translation of that phrase from Jesus in the Greek is, be not afraid, go on believing. In other words, Jairus, you had a certain amount of faith when you came to me, and your faith was even helped when you saw what I did for that woman. Don't quit. Don't let go of that faith. Keep a hold of it. Keep on believing. It was obviously much easier for Jairus to trust the Lord while his daughter was still alive, and while Jesus was still walking with him to his house, but when Jesus stopped to heal the woman and the friend came with the bad news, Jairus just about lost his faith. We can relate, right? There have been times when we've given a little bit more room for doubt than maybe we should have, when instead of only believing, we're kind of only fearing, when circumstances and feelings have simply overwhelmed us, when God has delayed and we find ourselves in a place of wondering, why? That is when we need that very same thing that Jesus gave Jairus in his moment of a crisis of faith. We need that same special whisper of faith from the Lord. Do not fear. Only believe. And ladies, we receive that whisper of faith as we spend time in God's word. Are you in his word? Remember the parable of the ten virgins? Five were wise and five were foolish. It was nighttime. And they were waiting for the bridegroom to come. The five wise virgins had brought extra oil for their lamps. The five foolish did not. So when the bridegroom, quote unquote, delayed, the five foolish virgins had no oil to keep their lamps burning. So they asked the five wise virgins to give them some. But the five wise virgins could not. They said, there's not enough for all of us. Go, get your own. There will be times. When the Lord takes longer to do something in our lives than if we're being honest, we think he should be taking. And during those times, it can get dark. It can get real dark. And you won't be able to borrow anyone else's oil to light your lamp. You're going to need your own oil. That oil is the word of God. You say, I read God's word this morning. It didn't click. I didn't get anything out of it. Well, maybe what you read today, you're storing up in that lamp and you're going to use it tomorrow or next week or next month or next year when a dark time comes. That oil in your lamp is the word of God and it's your own relationship with God. That oil is your time abiding with God. It's the oil of the presence of the Holy Spirit in your own life. And that can't be borrowed from anyone else. The kind of oil you need when it gets dark and the time gets long is the oil you have stored up for yourself. Nothing else will do. Get your oil. Stock up. Spend regular time in the word. Get to know the Lord for yourself in prayer. Grow in your relationship with him. He will provide all the light you need just when you need it most. Get your oil. So back to the text. By the time Jesus got to Jairus' house, his little daughter had died. The professional mourners were already there. The family was mourning. Jesus came. And he said, she's not dead, but only sleeping. 
and they all laughed at him. They failed to realize that Jesus is himself the resurrection and the life. Unbelief laughs at God's word, but faith lays hold of it and experiences the power of God. The mourners laughed at Jesus. Had they not heard that Jesus had recently raised the widow's son from the dead? Did they not hear of the same thing that, John, that Jesus had recently told to John the Baptist that the dead were being raised? Apparently, the mourners didn't believe these reports and they thought Jesus was a fool. So they had to go. Jesus put them all out of Jairus' house because what he was about to do was way too special for him to allow dozens of unbelieving, mocking spectators to just sit around and watch. Where is our heart hard towards Jesus and his miraculous power? Where do we find ourselves kind of laughing at what he can do in this earth or in the hearts of people? Let's be careful not to have the kind of hard, unbelieving heart that causes Jesus to show us the door. And then after he puts us outside of view, he does something absolutely miraculous and amazing. And we don't ever get to see it. Let our hearts instead say, Lord, I believe Help me in my unbelief. I know up here that you can do anything, but help my heart to believe that you can do anything. That's a prayer he will say yes to. Jesus took the parents of the little daughter and three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, and together they went into the room where the little girl lay dead. Jesus took her by the hand and spoke in Aramaic, Talita kumi, which means little girl, get up. This was not a magic formula or magic words. This was a command of the Lord of life and death. Her spirit returned to her body. And, uh, and not only that, but she was also healed of her sickness because we read that she was able to get up out of bed and walk around. Always the loving physician, Jesus instructed the parents to give her some food so that she doesn't relapse which is an illustration to show us of how divine miracles do not replace common sense human care. Otherwise, when we abandon our common sense, we are tempting God. And Jesus said, don't put your Lord God to the test. We must have common sense. His promise of protection is not a license for our recklessness. So I wanna address the elephant in the room. Jesus healed the woman with the blood discharge and he healed Jairus' daughter and brought her back to life. But what about us? What about me? What about my illnesses and my ailments? What about my loved ones? Did these stories of healing mean that God always must rescue his people from danger and ailments and illnesses and weaknesses and afflictions? No. Though he's able and he's good and he hears our prayers, that does not mean that he must choose to bring us healing. Although keep in mind, the woman struggled with her ailment for 12 years and then finally her healing came. So I think in that we are encouraged to keep praying, yes. But what these stories do show us for certain is that our God holds the ultimate authority and that we need not fear. Do not fear, only believe. Listen to 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10 in the Amplified Translation of the Bible. This is Paul talking. He says, And to keep me from being puffed up and too much elated by the exceeding greatness of these revelations that God had been giving me, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me and to keep me from being excessively exalted. Three times I called upon the Lord and sought him about this and begged that it might depart from me. But God said to me, my grace, my favor and loving kindness and mercy, my grace is enough for you. My grace is sufficient against any danger and enables you to bear the trouble manfully. For my strength and power are made perfect, and they showed themselves most effective in your weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will all the more gladly glory in my weaknesses and infirmities, that the strength and power of Christ the Messiah may rest, yes, may pitch a tent over and dwell upon me. 
So for the sake of Christ, I am well pleased and take pleasure in infirmities, insults, hardships, persecutions, perplexities, and distresses. For when I am weak in human strength, then I am truly strong, able, powerful, in divine strength. Have you experienced God's powerful divine strength in your time of absolute human weakness? Listen, just like God has a purpose in not removing Paul's thorn in the flesh, the Lord has a purpose in everything he chooses to do in our lives and a purpose in everything he chooses to leave undone. And in the time he chooses to take to accomplish his work. Through it all, he is fulfilling his good purposes. Listen now with his passionate consuming love for you at the forefront of his mind. He hasn't forgotten you. Psalm 139, how amazing are your thoughts concerning me, O God, how vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. You are on his mind. In fact, he can't get you off of it. Jesus said, not a sparrow drops to the ground apart from your father's will. And aren't you worth more than many sparrows? Yes. It even says right there, right after it mentions sparrows dropping to the ground, that God knows how many hairs are on your head. And I think what he's saying is that not even a hair falls from your head apart from his knowledge and his will. He is keeping you. Now you keep entrusting yourself to him who judges righteously. I want to close with the words of this powerful hymn by Annie Johnson Flint. She lived a very hard life in the 1800s. When she was a baby, her mother died. Shortly after, her father died. Later, both of her adopted parents died within a few months of each other. After that, her own health deteriorated rapidly and she became a helpless invalid with crippling arthritis so that she needed the constant care of another person for whom she had no financial means to pay. Soon, she also became blind, orphaned, arthritic, cancerous, blind, incontinent. This is hardship. She knew affliction more up close and personally than probably most of us here ever will. These are the words of her testimony recorded in her hymn entitled, What God Hath Promised. She says, God has not promised skies always blue flower strewn pathways all our lives through god has not promised sun without rain joy without sorrow peace without pain but god has promised strength for the day rest for the labor light for the way grace for the trials help from above unfailing kindness undying love. God has not promised we shall not know toil and temptation, trouble and woe. He's not told us we shall not bear many a burden, many a care. God has not promised smooth roads and wide, swift, easy travel, needing no guide, never a mountain rocky and steep, never a river turbid and deep. But God has promised strength for the day, rest for the labor, light for the way, grace for the trials, help from above, unfailing kindness, undying love. Amen. Thank you, ladies. God bless you.